Let's begin talking about how you make a hormone. Once in uh, one semester of my class, I asked the class, how do you make a hormone? And I had a girl whose uncle was a cop. She said, my uncle says, just show her your badge. I said, that's a good one. Um, so um, let's talk about making steroid hormones. So over on the right, you see cholesterol, that four ring structure. Um, I want you to be able to recognize that. Sometimes I put that on, on an exam. I say, what is going on here? Um, what kind of substance is this and what can you make from it? I would expect you to recognize that that's cholesterol. Then see, look on the left. See, cholesterol becomes progesterone, which then can become testosterone, cortisol, aldosterone. Testosterone then can become estradiol. So look at all of those. Cholesterol is indeed the backbone upon which all steroid hormones are built. So again, cholesterol is essential for human life. Um, peptides, um, we've seen before, um, you know, with the plasma proteins made by the liver, the zymogens, the pro-hormones. Um, look on the right, there you see pro-insulin. So that's an inactive form of insulin. What happens in many cases, we actually cleave off part of that and then the hormone becomes active. So that's how you convert a pro-hormone to a hormone. Um, so the cellular steps, the rough ER removes the segment, forms the pro-hormone. Golgi complex further modifies it. That's how insulin is made. You don't have to know those steps. I'm just trying to show you that it's really, it's kind of that easy. You just make this precursor, chop off a part of it, and then that activates the hormone itself. So. Yeah, you don't need to know the detailed steps. There's a Golgi apparatus in the lower left there. Remember from Bio 156? And the monoamines, we saw this in Bio uh, 201. The monoamines, uh, remember, are amino acid-like substances. Um, and the monoamines here, the main ones we saw in Bio 201, which we're going to see again, are the catecholamines. So all are synthesized from tyrosine, except melatonin, syn synthesized from tryptophan. So notice dopamine is a precursor of norepinephrine. Dopamine is actually modified inside of some neurons to become norepinephrine. So, and then norepinephrine in turn can become epinephrine. So these are very, very close, closely related. Look on the right, look at how similar the structure is. All right, that uh, six-sided ring with the two um, uh, hydroxyl groups on it and um, easily to, easy to convert between them. <coughs> That's a coronavirus. Um, thyroid hormone is, is unusual. It's a peculiar hormone. Um, T3 and T4 together are known as thyroid hormone. Um, and for our purposes, just thyroid hormone is good enough. But I still do want you to know that there are two different versions of it. All right. It's composed of two molecules of tyrosine that are basically glued together. And it requires a mineral, iodine. So why is one of them called T3? That's triiodothyronine, and the other is T4. That's tetraiodothyronine. So in other words, it's just the number of iodines they have on them. And you can see that here. There's T4 on the left, T3 on the right. So remember before I asked you, I showed you a picture of Chernobyl, the horrible nuclear accident. And I mentioned how after um, nuclear accidents, after the one in Japan, all along the west coast people hit the nutrition stores and bought out all the iodine. Why would people do that? Well normally where do you get iodine from your diet? And you can't say salt because that's only relatively recently in human history. They now add iodine to salt and that's because if you don't have enough iodine you get a condition called a goiter which we'll talk more about later. But what happens is normally you're getting your dietary iodine from you know plants. Iodine comes from the ground. So what happens is if there's a uh, if there's radioactivity, then the iodine um, that's in the ground can become radioactive. So what people do is they go to the nutrition stores and buy up the iodine tablets. And by taking iodine tablets, therefore you can make all of your thyroid hormone from iodine that is not radioactive. Um, a lot of times after um, radiation accidents, um, one of the most prominent uh, consequences you see is thyroid cancer. So that's the connection there, iodine. Iodine is, a, is an earth element. 
so you have to uh, have to use the pills after the radiation accident so you don't get radioactive iodine in your thyroid which leads to thyroid cancer so anabolic steroids um, you've heard about these anabolic catabolic remember anabolism is to build up catabolism is to break down so anabolic steroids formerly known as anabolic androgenic steroids AAS these are all steroid hormones that are close relatives of testosterone it includes androstenedione, oxandrolone, nandrolone, stenozolol, um, and many more. And these are all things you can buy at the gym if you know the right people or if you just ask around. Um, a lot of the guys who want to bulk up, and women as well, um, will start taking these um, as a means of uh, promoting uh, an increase in muscle mass. Uh, medical uses do include um, inducing pu puberty in males. Sometimes males, their puberty just needs a jump start, so you give them some anabolic steroids. Um, some cancer patients who have muscle wasting, you can treat them with that. Um, HIV patients as well. And then hormone replacement therapy. So um, then there are a variety of reasons why they do that. Adverse effects um, are, are profound. If, if you're a chronic high anabolic steroid user, you can start to expect some consequences such as hypertension, acne, higher LDL, liver dysfunction, and the psychological effects including aggression which they call the roid rage. Males can experience testicular atrophy, low sperm count, gynecomastia, that's a wonderful word, and premature baldness. Think back to something we talked about before. Remember how there were negative feedback loops? Um, so we saw with like thyroid hormone, the you know you had TRH coming from the hypothalamus, stimulated the release of <clears throat> TSH from the anterior pituitary, which stimulated the release of thyroid hormone from the thyroid. But then thyroid hormone would feed back on the pituitary and the hypothalamus, saying, "All right, we're good. We've got some. You guys can cut down your secretion." So what happens here? Testosterone normally made by the testes, uh, other things as well, but made by the testes. So if you're taking a lot of androgen, anabolic steroids, then what they're going to feed back on the testes and say, hey, you guys, slow down, we don't need any more, and therefore you get testicular atrophy. This is a well-known consequence with, uh, with the guys who are using a lot of the anabolic steroids, a reduction of ste uh, sex drive, reduction of sperm production. Um, you got these big, giant, bulked up, gorgeous looking guys and they can barely get it up. Females get increased body hair, decreased breast size, and large clitoris, deepening of the voice. It's funny, I had a girl in my class <clears throat> a little over 10 years ago and she was into bodybuilding. <clears throat> she was going to enter a competition and she asked me, this is a, a year or so after she'd been in my class, uh, if she should take uh, uh, anabolic steroids. She said she could get some at the gym. I said, no, don't take them. She said, well, I'm going to anyway. I said, well, thanks for the vote of confidence. She says, it's okay if I text you and let you know if anything goes wrong. I said, no, I don't, I'm not qualified to do things like that. She said, well, okay, I'm just wondering, you know, am, am I going to grow a penis? I said, I don't know, but if you do take pictures and send them to me, I'll show them to the class. It'll be awesome. She did use them illegally for a little while, and uh, she didn't win the competition, and she stopped, so thank goodness. Illegally used by athletes and bodybuilders. They're banned by all major sports, baseball, football, basketball, hockey. Studies have actually shown that the majority of illegal users are neither athletes nor competitive bodybuilders, but instead are heterosexual middle-class males in their 20s who use anabolic steroids for cosmetic purposes. Yeah, so there you go. One of your FBs right there. Ball is life. You're the only girl I talk to. Picks. Mm -hmm. And another term we saw there was gynecomastia. What the hell is gynecomastia? That's man boobs. So there you go. That's uh, that's a frightening diagram, isn't it? You got your old man droopers, your decuppers, your woolly mammaries, your lopsiders, frightened freckles, your mud flaps vampire bites yeah that's uh, we're never going to talk about this again let's talk about getting hormones to their locations all right so monoamines and peptides are hydrophilic so what does that mean well that means they're soluble in water 
Remember that blood is 55% plasma. Plasma is about 90% water, so blood is roughly 50% water. So the monoamines and the peptides are very happy traveling through the blood, okay? They mix easily with the blood plasma. Steroids and thyroid hormone are hydrophobic, so they don't travel easily in water. Remember before I said that thyroid hormone was not a steroid, but it behaved like a steroid, and here you see why. It's hydrophobic, so it can't really travel very well in the blood. So how do steroids and thyroid hormone transport, therefore? Well, they have to bind to transport proteins in order to get transported to their destination. The bound hormone is attached to the transfer protein, and that prolongs the half-life to weeks. We haven't formally talked about half-lives yet, but we're going to pretty soon. Um, half-life is a measure of how long it lasts in your body. See, the monoamines and the peptides, because they travel in the blood, they're easily filtered out by the kidney, and so they don't last a long time. But when you're bound to a big transport protein, remember, does the kidney uh, filter out proteins? No, it doesn't. So hormones bound to transport protein have much longer lasting effects. And that's why I've been saying over and over again uh, that steroids are powerful hormones. They're powerful in, for several reasons, but one is that they stay active in the body for a long period of time compared to the monoamines and the peptides. So yeah, protects it from enzymes and from kidney filtration. Steroids have effects that last for weeks, whereas many other substances have effects lasting only hours or minutes before being cleared by the kidney, all right? Unbound hormone dissociates from protein and leaves the capillary to reach the target. So when the, the steroid hormones get to their location, they dissociate from that transport protein. They have to leave the capillary, travel through the interstitial fluid, and then get to their target cell. At this point, they have a half-life of only a few minutes, much more like the monoamines and the peptides. So transport proteins in the blood plasma, albumin, which we talked about before, our old buddy albumin, thyretin, TGB, thyroxine binding globulin, uh, bind to thyroid hormone. I, I'm not hugely concerned with those. I do want you to know about albumin, because uh, we've been talking about albumin all semester long. Albumin is one of the hormone transporters. And know also that thyroid hormone has to be bound to a transport protein. Steroid proteins bind to the globulins, including transcortin. So that, again, is not critical for me. I just want you, again, to know that all of the steroids and thyroid hormone can't dissolve easily in the blood. They have to be carried by transport proteins. Aldosterone is the weirdo. It's a steroid hormone, but it has no transport protein, so it has a short half-life. And that makes sense when you think about it. Remember, that's part of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. This normally, um, aldosterone is released in response to low blood pressure. So chances are, you know, blood pressure, once you, once you activate RAAS, blood pressure is probably going to come back up pretty quickly. So you don't want aldosterone to remain active for weeks or months. Um, you end up with chronic hypertension. So it, it makes perfect sense that aldosterone is the exception. No transport protein, therefore it has a short half-life. So hormone receptors, they're located on plasma membranes, mitochondria, other organelles, or in the nucleus. And this is going to be an important distinction here. We're basically going to be uh, differentiating receptors that are on the outside of the cell versus receptors that are on the inside of the cell. And we'll see why that's a big deal here in just a couple of minutes. There are usually thousands for any given hormone. So, you know, a cell will have thousands of these receptors. Therefore, it can respond to a lot of hormones. Hormone binding turns metabolic pathways on or off. This is, again, why I've been emphasizing the power of steroid hormones. They go deep inside the cell and change the actual metabolism of the cell itself. They exhibit both specificity and saturation. So specificity, it means that the receptors will normally only respond to one particular hormone. So um, uh, a receptor for testosterone normally won't respond to aldosterone, okay? So that's specificity. Saturation means that you've only got a certain number of receptors. So once all the receptors are full, there can be no additional effect from taking or having more hormone available. 
So in other words, there is a limit to the effect of the hormone, and that limit is specifically because um, of the uh, limited number of receptors. If all the receptors are full, we say that they are saturated, okay? So specificity and saturation, both. Specificity, generally only respond to one hormone. Saturation, there's only a certain amount of hormone that they, your body can respond to. Above and beyond that, there might be hardly any response. So let's look at the mode of action here, about whether the receptors are outside or inside. Hydrophobic hormones can penetrate plasma, uh, penetrate plasma hormones and enter the nucleus. So remember, who are the hydrophobics? Those are the steroids and the thyroid hormone. So remember, if you're hydrophobic, remember back to day one of the semester, hydrophobic substances can normally diffuse right across cell membranes, and that's what can happen here. So on the other hand, hydrophilics, they normally can't get through. They have to bind to surface receptors on the cell, and they will normally uh, use uh, like a second messenger system in order to have effect inside. So that diagram on the left is really a good one, all right? So notice here that the little, uh, we've got free hormones, all right? The blue triangles are hydrophobic, the yellow squares are hydrophilics. So look what happens when those hormones are traveling in the blood. See the yellow squares? They can travel by themselves, they're hydrophilic, they dissolve easily. But look what happens once they leave the blood and try to get into a cell. They can't get in. They're hydrophilic. They can't get across cell membranes. So they have to employ a second messenger system, remember a GCPR, something like that, in order to cause their effects. Whereas, look at the hydrophobic hormones, which would be like steroids and thyroid hormone. Those are the blue triangles. In the blood, they have to have a transport protein to carry them. But look what happens once they leave the blood they go right through the phospholipid bilayer and get inside the cell. And again, that's why I look at the, the, the hydrophobic hormones can go deep inside, down into the mitochondria, down into, down into the cell nucleus. They easily pass right deep down into the very me mechanisms of the cell to cause profound effects. So look at A and B over there. Um, Notice uh, I'm saying which one of these is hydrophobic. Would hydrophobic be A or would hydrophobic be B? Stop the video for a moment, think about it. Which is hydrophobic, A or B? Yeah, that's right, hydrophobic is A. Hydrophobic goes right through the cell membrane, whereas hydrophilic are like B, they're like the big bad wolf. They have to huff and puff and try to blow your door down. So thyroid hormone here, thyroid hormone binds to receptors on the mitochondria. It increases the rate of aerobic respiration. So remember I said in a lot of ways, thyroid hormone is almost kind of like a growth hormone. It's a, it's a powerful metabolic hormone. It changes your metabolism profoundly. Um, ribosomes and chromatin increases rate of protein synthesis and transcription. Um, increases the number of sodium potassium pumps, therefore it generates heat, calorigenic, causes you to warm up. So a thyroid hormone is a very powerful hormone, and I've asked you before to try to imagine what would the signs and symptoms be of someone who uh, had either hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism, and I think we're gonna talk about that at some point. There you see a second messenger system, a GPCR with some cyclic AMP, Oh my gosh, those protein kinases. Ah, uh, reminds me of my days in cell biology. What in, uh, what, uh, oh my God, all the damn pathways you have to know in that class. There you go, protein kinase. Look at all those things. Diacylglycerol, inositol triphosphate, IP3. Um, oh, cell biology is a fun class. It really is, but oh my God, all the pathways. Holy smoke. All right, so tell me, which hormone is a peptide? Did you process this? Would that be oxytocin, aldosterone, epinephrine, cortisol, or thyroid hormone? I would expect you to know, for the hormones, which category they're in. Are they peptides, are they steroids, or are they the um, monoamines? So which one is a peptide? Oxytocin, all right? 
And there's me skinny dipping in the Colorado River. Thank goodness I'm out of the picture over to the left. Uh, but uh, this is up by Moab. This is the Colorado River, you know, 300 miles upstream from the Grand Canyon. This is, uh, this is along the White Rim Road, a 100 mile four wheel drive road that I drive every other year or so. It's great, there's a, there's a little fork, a little spur, I guess, that leads right down to the Colorado River. So I was just drive down there and there's never anybody. I've never seen another person here. So I just sit here and drink beer, and swim. And you can see my clothes there. Let's not be judgmental, okay? Um, you know, some days a girl just needs to feel pretty, okay? So, okay, I'll see you in the next one.